In economics, it's pretty common to need to perform some sort of constrained optimization. In other words, to maximize or minimize some objective function subject to a constraint or a set of constraints. For example, economists often want to maximize utility subject to a budget constraint or minimize production costs subject to a quantity constraint. Sometimes it's easy to do this using typical mathematical methods. For example, we can see here if we wanted to maximize the quantity x squared times y subject to the constraint that x plus y equals 5, we could simply solve for y, stick it back in, and then have a normal function in terms of one variable that we know how to maximize or minimize by just taking the derivative and setting it equal to zero. In some other cases, economists have developed formulas for the optimo specific classes of problems. For example, we see here a typical utility maximization problem with our bowed indifference curves and our linear budget constraint. And economists have told us that the optimum, or the optimal solution to this problem is at the point where the marginal utility of the good on the x-axis divided by the price of the good on the x-axis is equal to the marginal utility of the good on the y-axis divided by the price of the good on the y-axis. And they've done this math for us and just said when we see problems that look like this, this is the solution. That said, there are plenty of constrained optimization problems that aren't easily solved in one of these ways. Luckily, economists have the Lagrange multiplier technique at their disposal. A typical constrained optimization problem looks like this here, where we say we're trying to maximize or minimize. This technique is going to be relevant for both of these classes of problems some what we call an objective function f of x, y, such that or subject to the constraint that some function g of x, y has to equal some constant c. So we see that we have two parts here. We have an objective function that we're trying to get the most extreme value for, and we have a constraint that must be satisfied. Taking that to our typical utility maximization example, we can think of this f of x, y as the utility function that we're looking to maximize. And we can think of this g of x, y as our constraint being our budget constraint in this context. So you can think about the budget constraint that we typically draw just being our constraint that g of x, y has to equal c, or the total expenditure on the two goods has to equal our income. And you can think of f of x, y as our utility function. So you see here then that the indifference curves are in fact what mathematicians call our level sets of this function. So we can see, for example, that this first indifference curve here is where f of x, y is equal to some arbitrary c1. And then our second indifference curve here is the set of points where f of x, y is equal to some larger value, some larger utility, c2, and so on and so forth. With this utility, this indifference curve up here, is a set of points where f of x, y is equal to some constant, c3. The key feature of the solution to this optimization problem is that the two curves are tangent at the optimum point. In other words, the two curves have the same slope at the optimum point. Furthermore, the slope of a curve gives the direction that we must travel in order to stay on a curve. Because of the way that these functions are defined, with f of x, y being equal to a constant and g of x, y being equal to a constant, the slope of each of the curves actually represents the direction of zero increase in f of x, y and g of x, y. In contrast, the gradient of a function gives the direction of maximum increase in the value of that function. And just as a reminder, mathematically, the gradient of some function f of x, y is just the vector, the partial derivative of f with respect to x, comma, the partial derivative of f with respect to y. And the gradient of some function g of x, y is just 
the vector, the partial derivative of g with respect to x, comma, the partial derivative of g with respect to y. And mathematically, a gradient of a function represents the direction of maximum increase in the value of that function. Now, as it turns out, here, because we've defined these particular sets as constantly the direction of zero increase in the value of the function, just because they represent the points where f of x, y is constant, or g of x, y is constant, it turns out that the gradient of f of x, y is actually perpendicular to f of x, y at any point. And the gradient of g of x, y is perpendicular to this level set g of x, y is equal to some constant. Because f of x, y and g of x, y are tangent at our optimal solution, and we said that the gradient function of f and the gradient function of g represent vectors that are perpendicular or orthogonal to our curve, it has to be the case that, well, if two gradients are perpendicular to the same tangent or the same slope, then it either has to be the case that they're pointed in the same direction or that they're pointed in opposite directions. And this is the simple fact that we're going to use to build up this concept of the Lagrange multiplier. If the gradient of f and the gradient of g have to go in either the same or in opposite directions, it has to be the case that the gradient of f is some scalar multiple of the gradient of g. If the gradient of f and the gradient of g are going in the same direction, then our scalar multiple, which we're calling lambda here, is going to be positive. If the gradient of f and the gradient of g are going in opposite directions, then our scalar multiple lambda is going to be negative. It's usually not terribly important for our purposes, I just want it to be clear. And we'll see that this here, this condition translates to the gradient of f minus lambda times the gradient of g has to equal zero. And we can think about what this really means by using the definitions of the gradient functions. So here, we can say that because the gradient of f is equal to this vector here, and the gradient of g is equal to this vector here, that one vector is a multiple of the other if each of the components are a multiple of the other. So here, this would imply, let's use this formula here, this would imply that the partial derivative of f with respect to x minus lambda times the partial derivative of g with respect to x has to equal zero. And also, the partial derivative of f with respect to y minus lambda times the partial derivative of g with respect to y has to equal zero. So we can see that these are the optimality conditions that we're ultimately looking for. And as it turns out, the Lagrange multiplier method is just a way to get to these and also incorporate the original constraint that we were dealing with. To construct our Lagrange multiplier, or our Lagrangian, depending on how you want to talk about it, we need to do two things. First, we need to redefine our constraint a little bit. So I said, let's redefine, let's call it g sub 2 of xy. Let's just redefine that as g of x, y minus c, where c is this guy here, just so that our constraint becomes g2 of x, y is equal to zero. Because for the purposes of our Lagrange multiplier, our constraint is going to have to be something set equal to zero, and we'll see why in a second. The second thing that we want to do is we want to construct this L either usually seen as a script L like this or as a capital lambda. And L is pretty simple. It's just f of xy plus lambda times this g2 of xy, where this is just the left-hand the left side of the constraint, where the right-hand side of the constraint is, in fact, zero. 
it's weird. Usually by convention, we make this a plus lambda, but it doesn't really matter. We could do the same thing if we made it minus lambda. We would just get a different value for lambda here. So that's not a big deal. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you use a plus or a minus. And then what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to either maximize or minimize this L here. Because strangely enough, doing so is going to give us the solutions to the original constrained optimization problem. And we can see why by actually going through this exercise. Because if we want to maximize or minimize this L, well, what do we do? We take the derivative, we set it equal to zero, right? So taking the derivative here, our choice variables in this case are x and y and lambda. So we have to take the partial derivative of L with respect to each of these variables, and all of those things have to be zero. So if we say the partial derivative of L with respect to x has to equal zero, well, the partial here is just the partial of f with respect to x plus lambda times the partial of g2 with respect to x, and that has to equal zero. We also can say that the partial derivative of lambda with our script L here, or capital lambda, whatever, with respect to y has to equal zero, and that's just going to be the partial of f with respect to y plus lambda times the partial of g2 with respect to y, and that also has to be zero. Finally, our partial of our L with respect to lambda has to equal zero, and you'll notice here that the partial of L with respect to lambda is just g2 of x and y, which has to equal zero. So hopefully this looks somewhat familiar based on the discussion that we just had a few minutes ago. Because this is just what we saw before when we were talking about the gradients with a plus here for our lambda rather than a minus. And again, we said that this value of lambda is somewhat arbitrary. So these two conditions actually simplify to this thing that we talked about before where we said that it was optimal where the gradient of f was just some scalar multiple of the gradient of g. So that's what these two conditions actually represent, strangely enough. This last condition down here, notice it just simplifies to g2 of xy has to equal 0, which is in fact just our original constraint. So in fact, taking the derivative of this and setting it equal to 0 results in exactly those conditions that are going to give us the solution to the constrained optimization problem. In summary, you can use the Lagrange multiplier to solve a constrained optimization problem by completing the following steps. First, when you know that you have the problem where you want to maximize or minimize some function f of xy subject to the constraint g of xy is equal to c, the first thing you want to do is redefine your constraint as g of xy minus c so that the right side of your constraint becomes zero. If you're dealing with an inequality constraint, for example, budget constraints are typically constraints where you have to be spending less than or equal to your income, not strictly equal to your income, you need to think about what's going on there, and you need to be able to make a case that in the optimum, you're actually going to be bumping up against the equality part of that constraint, because that's what the Lagrangian knows how to deal with here. So for example, in the case of a budget constraint, you know that in the optimum, you're going to be spending all of your money because marginal utility of consumption is always positive. So oftentimes, this requirement that this be an equality constraint is not really a problem you just need to be careful that you're thinking about whether it is valid to treat an inequality constraint as an equality constraint. But once you've done that, you just set up your L here as f of xy plus lambda times your g2 of xy. And then your goal is to 
find the extreme points, meaning the maximum or minimum points, of this guy here. Which you do by taking the derivative of it and setting it equal to zero. Which means that the partial derivatives with respect to each of the choice variables have to equal zero. Which gives you these guys here. That the partial of L with respect to X has to equal zero. That the partial of L with respect to Y has to equal zero. And that the partial of L with respect to lambda has to equal zero. Then all you have to do is you get three equations and three unknowns, and you just have to go through some messy algebra to actually solve for those variables. Once you've done that, you're going to get a set of what are called critical points. And you're going to have to figure out, because notice that the process was the same regardless of whether you were trying to maximize or minimize this function here. You're going to have to go through all of your critical points and figure out which ones are, in fact, the ones that you're looking for, depending on whether you're looking for a maximum or a minimum. One of the upsides of the Lagrange multiplier approach is that, in addition to being pretty flexible, notice that there wasn't a lot of restriction placed on the functional forms that make for acceptable versions of f of x, y, and g of x, y. It's also the case that the Lagrange multiplier is very good at dealing with more variables and more constraints. For example, if we had more than two choice variables in our example, we could just extend this in a very straightforward way to say that our Lagrange multiplier equation was just f of x, y, z plus lambda times whatever constraint in terms of x, y, and z was relevant. So this extends directly to more variables you just have to make sure then that once you take the derivative that you're taking the partial with respect to x, the partial with respect to y, the partial with respect to z, and so on and so forth. So you're going to get more equations than you would have if you just had two choice variables or even one choice variable. But this extends in a completely straightforward way. Similarly, the Lagrange multiplier approach can handle multiple constraints as opposed to just one constraint. In that way, again, the extension is just that you would define a different lambda for each of your constraints. So in this case, we say that our Lagrange equation is just our script L is f of x, y plus lambda 1 times g2 of x, y plus lambda 2 times some h2 of x, y, which is the second constraint set equal to 0. And then we would just go through, again, finding the critical values of this function by taking the partial with respect to x, the partial with respect to y, and then also the partial with respect to lambda 1, which is going to give our first constraint, and the partial with respect to lambda 2, which is going to give our second constraint, and so on and so forth. So these sorts of extensions are hopefully very straightforward for you to think about. In economics, this value of lambda that we find through this Lagrange multiplier process actually has a very specific interpretation. You'll notice that this value lambda is actually the derivative of our Lagrange multiplier equation with respect to this function g2 of x and y. And what we'll notice is that this intuitively represents the additional value in the objective function that we can achieve by just getting a little bit of a bump in our constraint. In other words, by relaxing our constraint a little bit, how much more value in our objective function can we get? And that's represented by this lambda that we see here. The technical term for that is, in fact, a shadow price to say how much more utility could you get by increasing your income, for example, by some infinitesimally small amount. And that's just important to think about because it's something that comes up pretty often in economics specifically.